I would prefer not to. Herman Melville, Bartleby the Scribner, A Tale of Wall Street. Hello again. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' masterpiece. Chapter 35 concludes the hunting episode with the arrival of Merlin and Dulcinea. Note that the devil had said Dulcinea would arrive in the company of Montesinos. Is this another of Cervantes' supposed errors? As we shall see, the answer is absolutely not. At first, Sancho's optimism seems confirmed. Unlike the three foreboding carts of the previous chapter, Merlin and Dulcinea arrive atop a triumphant cart pulled not by oxen, but by six brown mules covered with white cloth and ridden by penitents. The penitents carry large wax torches and are also dressed in white. The description of Dulcinea is exotic. A nymph adorned with a thousand veils of silver cloth, all of them shining forth infinite leaves of gold sequins. The narrator specifies that she is between 16 and 20 years old. This is now also erotic. Careful though, Cervantes is setting us up. Pessimism invades the scene when a figure dressed in black and seated next to the girl stands up and removing his robe and veil revealed nothing less than the very figure of death, emaciated and hideous. This figure of living death recites a long poem composed of epic 11 syllable verses with little to no rhyme scheme. He proclaims that he is Merlin, rumored to be the son of the devil, and prince of magic and monarch and archive of the Zoroastrian science. Did you know Merlin was a recurring figure throughout the medieval period? He played the role of counselor and wizard opposite knightly characters, his most famous master being the legendary King Arthur. Note how a note of optimism returns when Merlin says he cares greatly for knights errant. He tells how he learned of Dulcinea's transformation from genteel damsel into a peasant girl and says that he has come to give the proper remedy to such great woe. Merlin praises Don Quixote as a Spanish warrior and now we learn how Dulcinea is to be disenchanted. For her to recover her prior state, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso, it is necessary that Sancho, your squire, give himself 3,300 lashes upon his two hind quarters exposed to the open air. Wait, does that mean Sancho must lash each of his ass cheeks 3,300 times for a total of 6,600 lashes? Sancho's reaction is hilarious. To hell with that way of disenchanting. I don't see what my backsides have to do with enchantments. He says that if Merlin can find no other way to save Dulcinea, then she can go enchanted to the grave. Angry now, Don Quixote deploys the formal address. Note also that our knight has realized that there are two ways to count Sancho's lashes. I shall take you, sir vileness stuffed with garlic, and I shall tie you to a tree as naked as when your mother bore you where I shall give you not 3,300, but rather 6,600 lashes. Recall the fate of the shepherd boy Andres, tied to a tree and whipped by his master Juan Aldudo. The novel has now come full circle from chapter four of part one. Now Merlin intercedes in favor of Sancho. It shall not be that way, for the lashes that good Sancho has to receive must be voluntary and not by force, and in the time that he wishes. This is crucial. Merlin insists on a fundamental natural law. Sancho is not to be treated like a slave. He must freely accept his lashes. Quixotic Mission. According to Merlin's prophecy, where does Sancho have to lash himself? A, his nose, B, his hindquarters, C, his testicles. Correct answer, B, his hindquarters. Sancho refuses with a Latin term used by priests to renounce Satan during exorcisms. Me, lash myself, abernuncio, I renounce thee. 
At this moment, the narrator has Dulcinea, the silver nymph, stand up, remove her veil, and direct a long speech against Sancho. She reprimands him for his selfishness and cowardice. She could understand his reluctance if they were asking him to kill his family with some sharp and horrifying scimitar, but this is not the case. She shouts at Sancho, echoing the theme of the squire as analogous to his own ass, miserable and hardened animal. Moreover, when Dulcinea asks Sancho to look into her eyes, she inverts the Duchess's phrase at the end of chapter 33, fix, I say, those eyes of a frightened little owl on these pupils of mine. She laments her altered state as her youth is consumed and withered under the bark-like skin of a rustic peasant girl, explaining that if she appears beautiful now, it's only because Merlin has made an exception so that Sancho will submit. Her final point is that if Sancho will not free her on her own account, then he should do so on behalf of his master. Do it for that poor knight that you see at your side. Turning mundanely funny, she claims Don Quixote is so anxious that his soul is trapped between his stomach and his mouth. Hilariously, Don Quixote actually checks his throat and concurs, I have my soul stuck in my throat like the nut of a crossbow. Sancho is also trapped between his master and Dulcinea and between the Duke and the Duchess. Like Dulcinea, the Duchess insists that Sancho answer and like Don Quixote, the Duke corrects his mispronunciation of Abre Nuncio. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. I hope you can join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.